when you I. said yes to me, you gave up the right to be like everyone else. That is why you draw experiences to yourself that will cleanse you, yourself of that which does not fit who you are. For me, this was a quote mm -hmm. or a teaching that Swami Sati Sai Baba gave to us all many years ago. And the thing that strikes me most deeply about it is something that most people probably don't think about. We think of this as a quote from the Satguru to the disciples and those who know Sati Sai Baba. But if you would let me, I would read the whole thing, but I first want to qualify it and say, this is something that Sai Baba did say to all of us. This doesn't fall into the realm of folklore. Correct. Correct. This is his Swami's actual words, but I wanted to qualify it. And I want to look in the camera and say, everybody from any religion, any background, understand, to me, a Satguru is the divine speaking. So whether your divine is Jesus or Allah or Buddha, Maharashtra, wh whatever the divine is to you, know that Sai, Satya Sai Baba said this, but the divine said it to each and every person on the planet in your own way. And he said, That's a great preamble, by the way. I just want to point when out. When you said yes to me, you gave up the right to be like everyone else. That is why you draw experiences to yourself that will cleanse you, yourself of that which does not fit who you are. Because who we are is the divine. He goes on to say, over and over, again and again, until I make you see the past no longer works. I challenge you and tempt you every day with your past so that you may see that the past is the ultimate delusion. When you said yes to me, you gave me the divine, your body, your thoughts, your actions. When they don't suit the new you, the uncomfortableness is unbearable. <laughs> I will be, it will be so every time, and until you realize this fully, then, and only then, will you completely give up desire. For this is the only way man will learn. Very seldom does he learn by quiet re reminders. Man's desires and pitfalls are placed there so that I, the divine, may do my work. When you give up totally, then the temptations will fade. I will never give up on you. Every slip will become harder to bear and less easy to remedy. You will tire of your foolishness because I love you. And though not completely aware of it, you did say yes. This is the divine. We all said yes to the divine, whether you talk about joy, peace, love, truth. Whatever background you've got, whatever religion you come from, this is the way the divine wants you to know that it's to give up these desires, that he puts these things in our path so that we can be angry or happy or sad and then get over it and realize that it's just an unfolding to remember the truth that we are the love, this consciousness, this purity that's inside of us that already knows. I want to I want to ask you a question yes. about this. You just read it so well. One, they all make uh, me just feel it viscerally. One particular part over and over again and until I make you see the past no longer works, I challenge you and tempt you every day with your past so that you may see that the past is the ultimate delusion. 
Is it just my imagination, or does this seem to kick in even more so with those who believe they're on a spiritual path? It seems <laughs> like if I weren't on a path, I would just ignore whatever some of the pitfalls are and push through them. But on the path, you can't ignore them. It sounds like he's trying to really grab your attention, even if he has to wrestle you to the floor. Yes. Because, see, the, the number one thing that human part of us wants to do is put it in words. Mm -hmm. All the things that we seek, the love, the peace, the truth, God, consciousness, awareness, wisdom, beauty, put any one of them in my hand. You can't do it. They have no form. But in order for us to communicate as a human, that's why the old saying becomes so laughably true. We try to talk it over, but the words got in the way. <laughs> it's what do we really seek? There's an old saying in India that I so deeply and dearly love. And the old saying is this, when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees is pockets. <laughs> you see, but that shows who he was, the pickpocket, and where his mind and where his past was. But if we really do with the Satguru, what the Guru tells us, try and see the divine in everything. Try and see the love in everything. Try to see the beauty in everything. So. If I go to wherever I go on pilgrimage, it doesn't matter where I go. He told Isaac Tigert one time, he said, pilgrimage is not about where you go or what you see. It's what you take away with you. What we take away with us is a sense of peace. But these things cannot be put into words. There is no tomorrow and yesterday because the divine is the eternal now. Because I can love right now mm. and oh that's gone and now I can love and oh that's gone and now I can love so it's to come back to each new now the most easily apparent for us as Western people to see this when you were a kid you know you're eight nine ten eleven years old and they told you when you were a kid hey it's only two weeks till Christmas the response was, oh, so long. Huh? Because these children live now so perfectly. But us, as adults, putting away those childish things and that innocence that Christ says we must find again, say, oh, two weeks? It's really fast. Because we're not living this now. We're not digesting what each new now brings that when we get caught up in it it becomes again a mental thing of the thoughts these are many lessons that you've needed to learn over and over again I can see oh yeah is this the reason why you made so many trips to Puta Party I mean is my math right 1975 to 2015 that's 40 years and I know last time Jody and I were there two years ago we were there for two months and there you were uh, Baba's mm -hmm. physical form long gone but you were there nonetheless and you're going back again he's there why do you make so many trips there if you have Baba within you why not <laughs> you see that's the truth of it you don't have to go anywhere you can have God right here right now this second you can have this love just simply put away what your mind's telling you. There's some dear friends of mine who many in the Psy community will know, Jack and Louise Howley. And Jack Just turned wrote 83 a book. about five days ago. Jack. Beautiful beings. And he wrote a book as commanded by Swami of the Bhagavad Gita for Westerners. Well, he went around and gave workshops on this for many years, he and Louise. And after some years, I talked to him now, this is now a number of years ago, 
And I talked to him and I said, oh, you know, and how's it going with the workshops? And he says, well, we're not doing talks on the Bhagavad Gita anymore. I said, oh. I said, but you're still going around giving talks and workshops? He says, yes. He says, but now what we're doing is we're giving workshops on self-realization. <laughs> and he says, because I know you're curious, John, he says, I'll tell you before you ask me. When we first go into one of these workshops, after we greet the people and welcome them, one of the very first things we try to put to them as a question to start off the workshop on self-realization is we try to ask them, remember to ask them, what makes you think that you're not already a realized being? <laughs> And there's two key things. The number one key thing is you already are what you seek. The second key thing is the word that they used, what makes you think. Mm -hmm. When you taste love, Swami showed me and told me, you can be love, but you can never understand it. Mm -hmm. Be the bliss, be the joy, be the God, be the divine. But when we go into that program of thought, the very idea of thought is problematic because it's based in duality. Mm -hmm. So when you come up with there's good, there's always a bad. When you come up with a high, there's always a low. And the mind will play that game of mental ping pong as much as we want to. But that's like I had said before, Swami said to some twins in, in England, if you really want to be one with God, give up all questions. Because when you taste that bliss that you used to get from Swami, and still do today if you center in your heart, there's no words for that. We try and put it into words. We try and share it and describe it to others. And they're so faulty and frail because that bliss, that wonder, that love, that by a, a, a single glance from his eye would fill you with more love than you knew could even exist, more than you could express, more than you could contain. Sometimes he would give you that look and you'd be so filled with love that you'd start weeping. And just because of how much love he had given you from a glance that you could not contain, other people around you started crying. <laughs> and Swami says, no, no, no tears. Prama drops. Mm -hmm. Crying is when you feel sorry for yourself. Yeah, hide in the corner. But when you feel this gratitude, this wonder, this joy, this bliss, he said, those are prema drops. And prema does not mean love. Prema means divine love. Mm. Show them to the world. Your divine love lessons that you've learned so well must come from multiple sources. Um, hmm. Being in the divine presence, uh, understanding his message as well as you have demonstrated already. Some people learn through his miracles. I mean, he was a man of miracles. And you were there long enough, you either saw plenty of them or perhaps you experience some of your own. And I would be remiss because I know there are people waiting for me to ask some Baba miracles that you don't mind sharing, assuming I was right and you saw them or experienced them yourself. They were too numerous to even write down. Uh, there's so many that I've forgotten. But I like to say sometimes that I think sometimes the smallest miracle are the big ones. And I'll tell you one that we all have. Everybody here in this room with me now, and any of you viewing out there that were around Sai Baba for even a little while, I'll tell you a small miracle that was one of the very big ones that I so cherish and honor. Huh? Keep talking. That miracle is this. Swami was so dynamic so bigger than life, so overwhelming in his graciousness, 
his grace, his love, his presence, that we forget he was an avatar. He was here for the whole world. He wasn't like just a regular Satguru that would sit around and have lunch with you. But that little miracle that was really one of the biggest, I'll just throw out a couple names for you. Professor Casturi, Jack Hislop, Arthur and Poppy Hillcoat, mm -hmm. the Pink Twins from Australia, and I can go on with a litany of these names. What's the miracle? I got to have lunch with these people. <laughs> I got to walk down the street and talk to them about God and beauty and love and also about what they were having for dinner. And because Swami was so much bigger than life, we forget the Kasturis and the Hislops and the Arthur Hillcoats and many that you yourself know and spent time with are and were saints. We got to hang out everyday life with saints. And our mind, it was like, oh, this is some nice guy that I get, and he's from another country, maybe I'll get to visit him one day. But think about it. Think about it. All my time with such a Sai Baba, and he was so much bigger than everything, that now looking back, I can't help but have gratitude that some of these beings were in my life and they were saints that I got to have lunch with and walk down the streets of the village with and many times travel to India with the Charles Penns and the Joy Thomases and I mean, you all have names and, and people that come to your mind immediately. You know, the Father Charles from Africa and from you know all these sources we got to hang out with saints now if that isn't a miracle <laughs> That we don't see that's really big, but it's real small because we don't notice because it's so every day it, Wow, it's There's, what I remarked to myself every time I ever went to Puta Party that as soon as I got up in the morning and told Jody after breakfast I was on the march it didn't matter to me on the march to where. Yeah. I could be going to the canteen or the latrine. Yes. Or to Darshan. Yes. Or to the main street. Uh, or to sit in the line waiting for Baba. It didn't make any difference. Always, and I mean always, there would be somebody with stories to share. Yeah. They're not there raising their hand waiting for you to yes. invite them to talk. They just can't mm -hmm. wait to share what they've seen and experienced. Yeah. And you did this for years and years. Yeah. I want to ask the six of us here uh, if anybody has any concerns or questions that they'd like to formulate that we might ask John about as we give him a second to think about some of the other events in your many years. And of while, you're, while you're thinking, I'll throw out real quick yeah. a couple little things. Mm -hmm. One of the pe beings that I remember with so much love I really wanted to touch the guy's feet, but I knew he wouldn't let me. He was the guy in Puttaparthi that used to clean the toilets. Mm. And that's all he did. He went from restroom to restroom. And no, most people never noticed him. He never said a word to anybody. But he was so at peace in that environment of that filth. Mm -hmm. And with so much love for Swami, he was a saint himself in his own way, you know, and again, as you're thinking, I'll, uh, because it was remarked to me earlier today that it might be something that other people would like to hear shared, was a time when I was in Cota Canal, you know, I was with a, uh, spending a lot of time with a dear old side brother, many of you maybe know, <laughs> uh, the man's name was James Sinclair, yes, James Sinclair. And while we were there, we were blessed to go into, the, I was blessed to go in the VIP lines in with James and we'd get in trouble because we like to tell a lot of satsang stories and stuff and people were shushing us. Um, but we got to go in and I was in the um, hall inside one day, which was very intimate. 
and Swami come walking in, and as Swami come walking in, I was sitting two uh, or three people from or two people from the aisle where Swami would walk, and three rows back from the front of the hall. And Swami walked in, and he came by, and he stopped in the aisle right next to where I was, and he looked over at James, and uh, James was smiling at him, and Swami said to James, um, How are you, sir? And James says, Oh, I'm fine, Swami. Swami kind of gave him this odd look, and little tiny shake of his head but didn't say anything and he walked to the front and he became right in front of where James and I were sitting but we were three rows back and Swami took some man's letter and talked to him for a minute and then uh, he looked up and he looked at James again and he again looked at James and says and how are you sir and James said well I'm fine Swami and this time you could see more of a head shake from Swami and as he shook his head, his hands started swirling. And the next thing I know, he was throwing something at James. And James, with his hand, he just reached up and caught it real quick. And immediately put something in his mouth. And I was astonished by this. It all happened so quick. I mean, it was really, really fast. And, but Swami was right there. But my curiosity was very much piqued. And so when Swami finally got done, taking letters and this and he turned and he started to walk back to his chair in the front of the hall for Bajans to start I couldn't contain myself anymore and I turned to James and I said James what was that all about and James looked at me and he smiled and he said well you know Swami knows everything and I've been telling them that I'm fine but he knows that I've been constipated for the last three days <laughs> and he says so he materialized for me a prune and I, that's what I just ate was a prune <laughs> you know? so, so you know the divine really does know everything we can't hide things from him you know? so James and Clara's story and uh, I remember not so long ago hearing about your story with um, Charles Penn based on his lesson to learn regarding humility Ah, uh, well, you know, uh, for the first twenty some years, I don't know, twenty four, twenty five years that I was blessed to go see Swami, I was one of those that I had a real need, you see, to learn patience. And every time I went back to see Swami, he'd say, "Patience is all the strength man needs." And you know, I'd think that I'd learn something, and then I'd go back the next year, and I'd sit there, and I'm ready for the next something. And Swami would come up and say, "Patience is all the strength man needs." And, and the next year was the same, and the next year, and this went on for more than 25 years. And these are directed at you, particularly. Oh, definitely directed just at me. You know, like I told you, I came with a lot of anger when I first went there, and. Um, <laughs> So this was uh, a profound, and still today remains one of the most profound of teachings when you delve deeper into mm -hmm. it. So this went on for more than, like I said, more than 25 years. So at one point, this was in the 90s, and I went back to uh, Swami, and um, I was sitting there, and my first darshan, and Swami's walking up and everything, and and... I'm thinking, oh, yes, yeah, Swami, well, I, I know, I know, I need more patience, yeah, <laughs> okay, fine. And I'm, by then, I'm kind of getting it ingrained that this is probably the only teaching I'm ever going to get from my Satguru, uh, uh, but I know I need more of it. So at that point, he walks up to me, and he looks at me, and he gave that little tiny smile that he gets, you know, when he's playing with you, and he looked at me, and he said, learn humility yeah. and he walked away <laughs> and I thought oh my god you know I mean there's some little bit written about patience in different books but as far as humility goes uh, I don't you know uh, uh, Swami directed me to some books that were from the 12th century and um, you know some ancient books that barely touched on humility it's not really written about so in order to learn something about this, one of the things that Swami blessed me with that immediately came to mind is one trip that I made to India was an extremely blessed trip. And on that trip, I was able to travel with Joy and Ray Thomas and, and uh, Charles Penn and his wife, uh, 
uh, and his mother, Althea, was also on that trip. And we flew into uh, Madras. It was Madras still at that time. And there in Madras, of course, they didn't have the jetways that we're so used to. And they would have a bus come to pick you up and take you to, uh, to the plane. Well, the bus came. And at that time, Joy was a very large woman. And she was having trouble getting around. And at that time, Charles Penn was probably about, oh, in his 60s, I'd guess. You know, uh, I'm not real sure. And when the bus came, the Indian buses are really high off the ground. And Joy looked at this and kind of was there to get on the bus. And it was very obvious that she wasn't going to be able to get on the bus. So myself and someone, another party that was in the group, we immediately turned and started looking for some airport personnel to see if maybe we could get a stepladder or something. And uh, as I'm doing this, I uh, look back to, you know, I was going to say, don't worry, I'll, you know, talk to some airport person. And when I look back, without any hesitation at all, because it had taken no time at all. In the time that it took me to turn around to even take one step toward the airport and then turn back to let them know I was going to get a stepladder or something, I look back and here's this beautiful being, Charles Penn, and he was on his hands and his knees and encouraging Joy to step on his back to be able to get into the bus, mm. which she did. Humility is that. At the time, he'd written books. People knew him around the world. He gave talks and all this. But rather than even looking for some other means, I saw his humility mm -hmm. in just using his body in that now, right now, without thinking. He just acted upon it. And so those things about humility, humility that Swami told me to learn about I might not have found them written in a description in a book, but there were people like this instance with Charles Penn where I saw it in a living action. Well, we're down to our last two or three minutes, and you've already convinced me that Baba finally got it through your thick head to learn patience. Otherwise, he wouldn't have moved on to humility. And that you sound like you've talked yourself about humility, too. Sum up the experiences, and there will be... An interview for, even if I have to come to Mount Madonna one day, I'll be happy to. We're back to Puttaparthi. You're welcome. To, Doors to open. find you there in Puttaparthi, I'll do that. I'd like to do that anyway. Uh, <laughs> how would you sum up a story of a man's life from 1975 forward that really has made an indelible uh, mark on anybody who's heard even a fraction of your stories about Baba's famous saying, not information, transformation. Did you ever realize one day how much you would see your own personal transformation take place? You know, that's really hard from an inner perspective to put into words because a lot of those things are probably best seen or noticed from other people. Uh, that I most days have a smile instead of the anger. I've learned to forgive. You know, it's like when things come into my life, I, I ask Swami, what's the spiritual reason for this? And when I'm in that realm of the human part of me, there's always two or th four or six or eight different answers with duality. But when I say, what's the spiritual reason for this? It comes back to a singular value in this now, right now. This now I need more forgiveness. This now I need more love, patience. Some singular value. And so in that I've seen and noticed transformation, but being the human that I am, I also still see my shortcomings. <laughs> and like humans do, we tend to look more at the shortcomings than at the values. Mm -hmm. um, 
well, depending on where your ego's at, but the more that he's bludgeoned my ego, uh, and I realized that the I is important and John isn't. The more that that happens, then I'm able to allow those things that you call transformation, maybe to say that I allow those things to correct themselves. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't think there's anything that's intrinsically bad or wrong or intrinsically good. Mm -hmm. Things just are what they are. And then humans put a description or a judgment on what that is. And the more I relinquish these questions of just accepting what it is and try to see what spiritual um, unfolding that he's got for me in this now, I don't think about all that transformation stuff so much. I do have a book at home that I think for anyone who's interested, you can find it at the ashram or in Tustin, and it's called Transformation of the Heart. And Judy, <coughs> excuse me, Judy Shear, who wrote this book, that's what she talks about, is it isn't so much about anything else, but when that transformation comes, when we move, the only way that I can put it for myself is when we move from our head to our heart. Yeah. Because in my head, God, it's still a mess. Mm -hmm. In my heart, i got no problem. You and I are the same. That's great. John Moore, thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of part, this is the end of the third interview, and I look forward very much. And I love you, and I love you, and I love four. you. Love you too. God bless. <laughs> Syrah. And uh, to say the least. And uh, uh, everywhere I went, there was this group of guys, you know, the men that were separate. There was this group of guys like that. And I couldn't take it. So uh, these were the days when everybody could get inside the Bhajan Hall for, for a week and a half, almost two weeks or something. <laughs> Went into the Bhajan Hall. <laughs>